All right. So I, um, I'll just start by saying I so would prefer to be in the room with everyone. Um, of course, the pandemic prevents that, but I'm here. You're here. Let's do this. We tell our youth that knowledge is power, but they see that power comes from money. We tell our youth to get involved, but they can't vote. How can anything change if so few people control so much money? And how can you make a change if you can't vote? Well, power may come from money, but change comes from people. We're building the world's first platform for democratic financial decision-making in schools. How? We give students a real money budget and we support them as they decide how to invest it. They make real change happen in their school with real money. They harness money power. Okay, now that I have your attention, I'm gonna go through the normal presentation. So a little bit about me, I'm a husband and father, I'm a serial entrepreneur, I've also been a philanthropist, uh, some of you, I hope, may know me through my work. Uh, I've served on the board of the Agile Alliance. I've produced the Scrum Alliance collaboration at scale. I've tried to share my knowledge and my experience as best I can um, uh, through the, uh, uh, the um, sorry about that pop-up, by the way, uh, but I've tried to share my knowledge as best I can. So now we're going to take this and we're going to build on it. So who are we? First Root is a benefit corporation, which means that we are trying to create a social good around teaching financial literacy and addressing the harmful effects of economic and income inequality. We do this through participatory budgeting. And this is an outgrowth of innovation gain uh, by a feature, but it's also part of what we've been doing around the world in both the public and private sector. It's a five-stage process where students are brought in, they design the process, they create ideas and proposals, the students refine them, the students vote on them, and the students fund, and they get to see the results. Now, why are we doing this? This is some research out of some uh, social scientists out of the UK from the spirit level, and it's a fantastic book, and if you really want to read something that's going to change your world, I would read this book. What these researchers did was they studied and correlated economic equality with health and social problems. And they found a simple correlate. The more unequal the society, the worse it performs. And the US performs horribly on every dimension. In the United States, we have the lowest levels of trust, the highest levels of obesity, the highest levels of mental illness, the highest levels of addiction, the highest homicides and imprisonment and the lowest math and literacy rate. And you guys just go on and we've got to do this. I mean, I know Agile is about creating better workplaces and creating better solutions, but I always believe that Agile should be more. It should be about truly addressing the most fundamental problems we face in the world. And if you look, and I know I have people uh, from the UK on this call, uh, you know, the USA is the worst. The, UA, the UK, candidly, is not a lot better. Where other friends in Europe are doing better, the, the Nordic countries especially. Now, I think of this as two-thirds of the problem. I think the other third of the problem is the massive lack of civic engagement. If you look at what's happening to democracy as an institution, democracies around the world, our belief in democracy is plummeting. And we're seeing increasing uh, failures. I mean, it, what, here's, here's a statistic that really frightens me. In 2018, according to the Pew Research, people in Russia had more trust or more satisfaction in their government than people in the US and the U UK. So these are things that really bother me and things I want to fix. So how are we going to do that? Well we're going to look at, well, what makes a good startup and how do we go about fixing it? So to get a good start to a startup, you need a compelling problem, a large market, uh, something that's desirable, viable, feasible, and sustainable, someone who cares, the caring and competent team, 
a pinch of humility because you're going to be endeavoring to create something new and a kilo of crazy. So we're fighting financial inequality so that we can address those trends around the world through a participatory budgeting app for school. We've got a caring and competent team. I know I'm both humble and crazy because when I started innovation games, everyone was like, what games? No one's going to play games at work. And now we're playing games all the time. We just call them, you know, retrospect speedboat or sailboat retrospectives and things like that. So we know we have these elements. So how are we going to build a startup? Well, you have to do all of these things. You have to understand your customers and you want to use design thinking. And of course, we want to experiment through things like the lean startup and we're agilists, right? So we don't just push a product into the market. We want to collaborate with our market, but we do need to plan our releases. We need to have a forward projection of what we're going to do and when we're going to do it. And finally, we need to make these investments in our architectural runway so that we can build a solution that will scale. Well, wait a minute. Hey, isn't all of that in SAFE? SAFE puts the customer at the dead center of everything we do. And all of these aspects are in SAFE. So let's go through some of this and see what aspects of SAFE that help us make the right decisions, help us build the right thing, and help us build the right way. So we're going to start with portfolio SAFE. There's, there's several configurations of SAFE. Um, most people look at SAFE at the full and large solution configuration and think of it as complex, but it's not. We can, we can start with the portfolio configuration, which has kind of all the elements that we need and some of the elements that we aspire to need in the future. So at the portfolio level, we're gonna keep a canvas like the business model canvas. We're gonna keep the safe lean startup cycle. We're gonna look at keeping roadmaps because we wanna have a projection. We're gonna change a little bit because the company is small. We don't have a portfolio. We only have a company. So we don't really need the portfolio vision and we're gonna call it the company vision. We're going to keep the cadence of how we make big decisions. And of course, uh, we're going to keep participatory budgeting because it helps us make better decisions. But we might change who's involved in participatory budgeting. We're going to defer the portfolio canvas because we only have one solution. We don't need that. And we're going to defer investments by horizons because, again, we only have one solution. And it's the horizon three start of the company itself. Now. A couple of things that we're really going to add and, uh, uh, and uh, emphasize is one is uh, most startups don't start with a huge employee force. We start with working with partners. So we want to use a, a vehicle to work with partners that we can uh, create a really good outcome. So we want to use a partner we know and trust. We want to give them a sufficient time horizon. So I'm using an outsourced development team that I've known for a while. And we started with a six month contract. We established a cadence, but we're running short iterations. We're still running one week iterations because we're focusing on learning and education. So we educate, we educate, we educate. This is one of the really important uh, facts about how I like to work with partners. In my world, if you're a partner, you're no different than an employee. So if I'm educating my employees, I'm educating my partners. And the, my partners and my developers, they've seen the pitch deck that we give investors. We produced participatory budgeting processes in the company to help them learn the processes. Now, we're gonna talk about building the right thing and building the right way. First, building the right thing. In SAFE, that's really in the domain of agile product delivery. We're gonna look at uh, customer centricity and design thinking, and then we're gonna add in some of the mechanics. So we're going to keep all sorts of stuff. We're going to keep the Simon Sinek golden circle so we know why we're building what we're doing. We're going to make sure we understand the value propositions and integrate our uh, CICD pipeline. We're going to do customer and journey mapping with a few additions I'm going to talk about. We're going to make sure that our pipeline is up and running and we're going to invest a lot in our uh, architectural runway. I'm going to change a few things, um, especially about personas and the program increment. For those of you who know SAFE, what a program increment is. And I'm going to add a few things. Uh, SAFE talks a lot about testing, um, but it's a little silent on uh, usability testing. And I want to really emphasize usability testing. 
And for those of you who know me, especially uh, the story with Chris Matz and his uh, graphic novel, I'm a huge fan of graphic novels and comics. So instead of uh, using story maps per se or journey maps, we do a lot of uh, comic books and graphic novels. And I'll talk about that in a bit. So in fact, I'll talk about it right now. Before the story map, there is a story. So if you want to see our personas, but more importantly, the stories behind those personas, you can go to firstroot.co slash UX artifacts. These are open source artifacts that you can use in your training or your work or your examples, but you can actually see the story of how we're guiding our users and our customers through creating better outcomes. Now, we also want to improve through retrospectives. So if you look at design thinking, eventually you get into the second phase of the, of the problem where you're really delivering a solution. Now, what we found was that we were using Flutter and our designers were designing at, without regard for how our implementers were implementing. And we found through a retrospective that if we brought in Flutter uh, knowledge into the design team, we were more effective. And let me show you a concrete example. This was our first home screen, and we were modeling it based on how video games and other games work with a map. But what we found was that this graphic image was really hard to implement in Flutter. So what we did was we changed it to a workflow with a Flutter component that lets us you know, keep a visually appealing structure, but it matches what Flutter gives us. And this is not um, something that's positive or negative about Flutter. It's just the idea that if you're doing retrospectives, your retrospectives have to actually change your process and uh, to really get the benefit of the retrospective. So this is a concrete example of how after a couple of months of working, we were like, wow, is there a way that we could really improve our use of Flutter and our process? And this is an example of where we are right now. You'll notice that um, the student experience of First Root is highly designed. So we took the example of Flutter, we took those story maps and we went and we worked with high school students to understand what are the apps that they're using now, Instagram, uh, Discord, Among Us, Twitch, and we created experiences that are beautiful. Now, for some of you who've seen my prior work in the Weave platform or Safe Collaborate, you'll know that participatory budgeting in those platforms is a more complex thing. You can have multiple people, each with money and they're allocating money and negotiating. For kids, uh, we have a different experience because they don't have the same complexity and we wanna give them something that creates a faster and more positive civic engagement experience. So you can see a reconceptualization of how voting works in a way that gets people to draw in uh, to that process. Now we augment this with a financial literacy and civic curriculum for teachers. And in our curriculum, we can have, now that they're voting, we can have a conversation and a lesson about how do you design voting systems in a democracy to create the best outcomes for that democracy? Do you want to have ranked choice voting? Do you want to have majority voting? You can start to really engage with students because they've had a positive voting experience. Um, now, when you have no solution at all, everything is an architectural runway. And that this is your Uber architecture. Now, if you're a modern SaaS company, you're almost certainly going to start with one of the major cloud platform vendors. So we looked at Google Cloud, we looked at Microsoft Azure, we looked at Amazon Web Services, and these are all fine choices, right? All of them are excellent vendors. So as a leader, I've got to make a choice. And so I talked to my team about that choice and I said, okay, team, we all agree that Google Cloud, Amazon, and Microsoft Azure, they're all good platforms. What is the platform that you know the best? And yes, this introduces a certain form of decision-making bias, but I'm choosing that bias. I wanna leverage experience where I can. And the team said, look, we actually know Heroku well because we've built applications on Heroku and we can get something up and running really quickly. We know how it works. 
So we chose Heroku. Now, again, I want to stress for anyone who has a preference for a different cloud platform, I think all three of the major cloud vendors are wonderful offerings. But sometimes you really do bias your decisions based on the experience of your team. And that creates an architectural one way that lets you build features in the future faster. Now, you have to trust your experience. When we were building our first version of the application, I wanted a lot of things. I wanted internationalization and a cross-platform client and a gorgeous experience in an API-driven model with an event-sourced architecture and patterns and compliant with you know, European regulations like GDPR. And I wanted those on the first get-go. And you might look at this and say, wow, Luke, that's way too much to build because the lean startup methodology says you can just, you know, you know, this is where the agile community says, you know, yag me, you ain't gonna need it. Well, you kind of do. If you want to be successful in the European market, you kind of need GDPR. If you want to be successful in schools, you kind of need to support different languages other than English. If you have aspirations of scale, you kind of want to start with event sourcing because it's a great way to scale. You also don't want to build things from scratch. We've got patterns out there, so why not leverage the patterns? So we have to build this team out who doesn't know everything, right? So my team knew Heroku, but they didn't know the problem domain. We needed to make sure they were understanding the mission. We need to choose the Uber architecture. So we spent a lot of time, right, not worrying about a you know, a, a sprint zero, if you will, or a PI zero, we just used the first few months of working together where each iteration was focused on learning milestones. What's the learning milestone for spiking the data model? What's the learning milestone for running a participatory budgeting program? What's the learning milestone for using Flutter? And I've got an example of something about Flutter in a bit. How about the API? Um, we started with a RESTful API. We figured out that REST wasn't meeting our needs as well as uh, GraphQL, so we switched. We started building our app in React. Uh, we found that React wasn't meeting our needs, so we switched to Flutter. And I'll talk a little bit about some of these things in a, a bit more. But notice that I didn't worry about how we were starting, except I was using Agile to maximize learning and feedback. Now, we didn't start from scratch on patterns, right? I'm a huge fan of David Hayes' enterprise model patterns and Martin Fowler's uh, analysis patterns. And both of those authors talk about a pattern called party, which is how to model uh, entities and relationships in a system. You should not be making this stuff up. If you're building a system and you're not leveraging patterns, then I don't think you're being agile, to be really blunt. You should not create everything from scratch. That's not agile, that's daft. That is just wasting money and time. Why not start with stuff that works, both from a, a componentry standpoint, but also from a conceptual and data model standpoint. So this was the conceptual structure, and then this is how we uh, implemented it for first root, and we followed it pretty closely. Now, where we have uh, differences, and I'm not expecting you can read this chart, but this chart is the state model for a participatory budgeting cycle and an individual proposal and all of the different states that a proposal can go through and all of the different ways in which a proposal can be manipulated. We built this in Miro, and we spent a lot of time getting our state model right and getting our data model right before we started worrying too much about the user experience on the front end. Now, there's a few more notes I'd like to share. Um, startups aren't easy. And there's a lot of reasons why people don't do startups, but it's hard, right? Because when you've heard the phrase sunk costs, we have sunk emotions. So I mentioned that we had to switch from React to Flutter. As you can guess, some people on the team who had promoted React, they had to deal with the emotions of changing the Flutter. That wasn't too hard, but we're there. We explored REST. 
uh, then we chose GraphQL. We even had to change our company name. Our original company name was Tilladin. And then uh, when we got our first logo gear, even our first logo gear was broken. So our coffee mugs and our coffee cups were broken, right? And when our team who was new to event sourcing built their first version of the system using an event sourcing architecture, it was really quite poorly performant. And there were some mistakes made about how to implement uh, 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 event sourcing that we fixed. And now we have a performant system, but there were some really nasty performant issues. Now, our first release was complete, uh, was incomplete. Remember I said that participatory budgeting has five phases. Our very first release of the software allowed you to do one thing, create proposals. You couldn't vote on them. You couldn't implement them. You couldn't do a lot of stuff. But we wanted to get that software out and running. And we had a partner who wanted to use the software to create proposals. So we released it. Now, we also, when our first release had a, I would say, a relatively immature CICD pipeline and a release on demand process. So we got our first app up and running in a few months. And I would say right around now, I feel like we've got a, a, a more mature CICD pipeline because that stuff, it, you read about CICD pipelines and people make it sound, oh, it's so easy, you know, just snap these things in, use Jenkins, you know, use this and you're gonna get a CICD pi pipeline up and running instantly. Uh, that's not the truth. The truth is, uh, CIDC pipelines uh, take a bit of work, right? And you got to put it on the backlog for the team to do the work. Um, they're not easy, but startups are sure fun. Uh, remember that chart that I showed at the beginning? Uh, so we know our work matters and we know it matters from around the world. We know that students love our work. We're doing retrospectives on our pilots. The feedback from students are is amazing. Uh, they They... They fund infrastructure in their schools. They, they make great stuff happen. We're learning and growing. And yes, I am totally thankful that we have a method like SAFE because one of the questions that you might ask is, well, Luke, why are you starting with SAFE? Well, the answer is because if I start with a different method, I have to add a bunch of stuff to that method to answer the questions that I'm talking about. By starting with SAFE, I've got something that's complete. I've got something that I can use with a globally distributed development team. I've got a team in India, in London, in Washington, DC, in Mexico, in the Bay Area. I need something that I can get everyone aligned to quickly. And SAFE is a reference standpoint, uh, from a reference standpoint, gives me something that goes around the world. Now, we're not interested in just solving a US problem. We're interested in solving a global problem. Participatory budgeting is endorsed by the United Nations. It actually started in Porto Alegre, Brazil, expanded into Europe, expanded into uh, uh, Africa. I was among the people who started doing it in the United States. It's now expanding in the United States, but we think this is a global problem. And I want everyone to imagine one final thing. I want you to imagine the following. If I walk up to kids in a classroom and I give them 10 pounds or 10 euros or 10 US dollars, they have a few hundred dollars or a few hundred euros that they can use to make their classroom a better place. If I give that school, and I'm just gonna switch to American dollars, if I give that school $10,000, they can make a meaningful impact in their school. There's 98,000 schools in America. If I give each of those schools $10,000, I will put a billion dollars in the hands of kids to make their world a better place. If I expand that around the globe, there's 3 million plus schools around the world. What would happen if that amount of money were put into the hands of our children to make their world a better place? it would be remarkable. I hope you can join us in this journey. Thank you so much for listening. I think we might have an opportunity for a question or two. Um, I, would, I, I promise everyone in every talk I give, if you put a question in the chat, I will answer it. 
if I don't have time now. Again, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Luke. Uh, we actually, yeah, we have five minutes left. I was about to interrupt for the five minute warning and you you got it spot on. Um, we've asked, we've had two questions so far in the chat. Um, so we'll start with those. Um, but if anyone does want to ask any questions, do pop them in chat or raise your hand. We've got about say five minutes for that. Um, and Luke Craig, has promised- yeah I, can, yeah, I can grab a few. I've got Craig Coburn. Hi, yeah. Craig. And you and Craig asked, can you correlate this against functional democracy? I actually can't because I've never actually heard the phrase functional democracy. So I'm, I'm ignorant of the question's um, uh, description of functional democracy. Uh, well, I'll just do the, uh, a comment on um, you know, places like Switzerland often do a lot of um, public referendums. And uh, there was a recent incident where one wasn't held in accordance with the rules, so they ran it again. There is contrasting that with like the Brexit, which was a quite controversial thing in Britain. And uh, they, they found that, th I suppose it's really just tying things up so that politicians are genuinely accountable. Because there's a growing trend, we see this both in Britain and America, of politicians just lying to get into office and then doing what they like. And so, you know, if you can just lie to get into office, it's almost like uh, it's kind of taking democracy down and there's no genuine accountability, so then people disengage. That's right. That we see that in the trend line, right? You see the the, the dramatic disengagement with democracy because of ex the phenomena that you talked about. Um, I do believe that participatory and budgeting schools helps address that problem. There's research from uh, Arizona State University which studied uh, a simple question: Do kids who participate in a participatory budgeting program uh, become more engaged in their democracy? Do they register to vote? Do they participate in community? Do they vote? And the answer is yes. So I think that by creating positive democratic experiences in a classroom or in a school, we can start to create a foundation for greater civic engagement. This is a long-term problem that we've got to fix, but I do think that, that this is a positive um, outcome uh, for, for the, what you would call a functional democracy. Um, David says, can this be used with primary schools? Absolutely, David. Uh, we're doing a pilot right now with uh, fifth graders in America, which is, are about, uh, which are kids who are about um, uh, nine to 10 years old, and it's working fine. If you look at financial literacy, Financial literacy concepts are starting to be developed in children as young as the age of two. When a child goes to a store and makes a purchase request, that's actually a financial literacy opportunity. When you give your child at four or five a little bit of money at the farmer market or at the open air market, and you say, here's some apples, you know, here's five quid, go buy them, and they have that transaction, you're actually teaching the one of the core elements of uh, financial literacy, right? Using money to, to buy goods and services. So we believe uh, that uh, this process starts uh, right when kids get into school. 